So thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, this platform is called EMCC Connected. So it's our Zoom platform for connecting people um, in our denominational family to be able to have conversations and dialogue around um, pertinent subjects that are affecting us as leaders today. So it's wonderful to have all of you on here participating today. Um, today, we are having Valerie um, teaching us about walking confidently in the spirit. I don't know about you guys, but COVID's kind of shaken everything up and caused us to not be able to lean on ourselves in the same way that maybe some of our routines and programs have allowed us to in the past. And we're finding ourselves needing to really hear God and um, listen to what he is saying. Valerie is one of our enrichment facilitators. Um, she is uh, for the area of evangelism. So she's led evangelism team of about 80 people through Center Street Church since 2010. And their strategy is this, to listen to Jesus and to do what he says. So sometimes we don't think of evangelism that way, but the core part is listening to Jesus and doing what he says. And the result of that is that people have an encounter with Jesus a living encounter with a living God. So today she's gonna to be talking to us as leaders about confidently walking in the spirit as leaders. We all need that right now. Um, this fits into the EMCC in a couple of ways that I just wanna to touch on. One is um, we have something called the way of Jesus. And one of our main markers for the way of Jesus is I have begun to follow Jesus and I am depending on his spirit in my journey. Um, I am depending on the spirit of Jesus in my journey. Um, so that's what today is going to be about. And also a couple of our values are spirit-led living and unity. Um, so spirit-led living is we value the spirit of Christ and his varied and abundant ministry in people and churches. And unity is we value the oneness of Christ expressed through unity in essentials, liberty in non-essentials, in all things. We recognize there's a lot of diversity in our denomination of the EMCC, but our goal today is to understand and operate in uh, the spirit better because of our participation today. So I'm excited to have you guys all here. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our facilitator today, uh, Valerie Hoffman. Thank you so much, Krista. It's so nice to see you all here today. Thank you for joining me. I hope you did drink an extra cup of coffee today so that you are ready and alert because you may find me like a fire hose this morning as I'm passionate about this topic. So I grew up in a church culture where God the Father and God the Son were talked about often. God the Holy Spirit was a little bit unsafe to talk about and to me that made him a little bit exciting. Unfortunately, the theologies around this incredible person of the Trinity and how he operates causes a lot of division. Now, we don't want to avoid subjects and especially a part of God that we have been told is available to us. So instead of dividing about us, about it uh, among us, let's honor one another, let's sharpen one another and drop our defenses and explore what is available to us as believers in Christ. After all, the Holy Spirit is Christ in us and the mystery that was kept hidden for ages and generations. And the prophets long to have what we have, this Holy Spirit of God dwelling and flowing through us. It's not something that we should be taking for granted. So let's dive into a subject that is controversial and discernment. I wanna first talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That is something that I think we need to all get on the same page on. What are the roles of the Holy Spirit? And what is these terms that we hear when we hear about filled with the Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit? Does this happen at salvation? Does it happen after salvation? Does it happen just once? Is it an event? Does it happen continually? Now, I know there's many theo theologies around this subject, and I do want to give credit to Pastor Ashwin Romani from Center Street Church for contributing to research and the following information on it. So if you've been in the church for a longer amount of time, you'll probably have heard the phrase baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this phrase is tossed around as we have our Christianese discussions in the church. This phrase can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different Christians. Baptism of the Holy Spirit 
is a metaphor. It's a picture of being drenched, immersed, and soaked. And when repentant sinners come to Jesus, their relationship um, is restored to God. And then just as a person is immersed in water, becomes soaking wet, Jesus plunges us in his spirit and we have become drenched and soaked and immersed by his spirit. We know that as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and it is confirmation that we now have access to God. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, the Spirit of God was already active. He did not inhabit all people, but he came upon select individuals, empowering them for specific tasks. And with the coming of Jesus, the Spirit of God now dwells inside of us for those who come into relationship with the Lord. Now, if you are a Christian, as I imagine we all are on this call, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. So Jesus not only removes our sin, but he also baptizes us and immerses us with his spirit. Now, the question is, when does this occur? Well, there are two main broad views, and I say main broad views. The first perspective is that the filling of the Holy Spirit occurs right at conversion and that it happens one time based on these verses. Acts 2.38, when Peter says that we are to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for our sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have 1 Corinthians 12.13, and I underline that word all, for we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So we are all, as Christians, have been given the spirit to drink and been given the spirit, the receiving the gift of the spirit at conversion. Now, the second view is of when someone is filled with the spirit is after salvation. And that's based on the writings of Luke in Acts. We have Acts 1 to 4. And that's when Jesus is talking with his disciples. And he says, don't leave to go do ministry until you've received that gift that you've heard me speak about. And, and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The disciples are told, wait, you, you need the Holy Spirit to go expand that gospel. Now, these di disciples had been with Jesus and they were already believers. And then we have the whole chapter of Acts 2, and that talks about that day of Pentecost where they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So who is right? Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit happening at conversion or is it happening sometime after? Well, I would like to propose that both views are correct. However, both views have a wrong assumption. <clears throat> the assumption is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit only happens once. It's a single event. And the reason this assumption is incorrect is that scripture doesn't have rigid parameters on this topic. And I do believe that this is intentional. To be baptized by the Holy Spirit is a metaphor. It's a picture. It's not this technical term referring to just one event of the Christian life. I'm gonna show you what I mean. We have John 1 and it says, I did not recognize him, but he sent me to baptize in water, said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now, this is John the Baptist, and he's talking about his conversation here with God, and God is telling him about Jesus, his son, and God is saying that Jesus is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. That word baptizes in the Greek emphasizes continual. To capture the meaning of this word, it should be read, this is the one, Jesus, who baptizes and continues to baptize in the Holy Spirit. It means to fill and keep on filling, to drench and keep on drenching. The phrase being baptized in the Spirit is interchangeable with the words in the Bible, empowerment of the Spirit filling of the Spirit, anointing of the Spirit. Salvation gives us full access to that Spirit of God, and we need an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit as a person. We see this in Acts chapter 2 and all the way to chapter 4. The Apostle Peter was filled with the Spirit three times. 
We have Peter was filled with three times. And also there's references to the Apostle Paul being filled three times. So we know that it's not a one-time event. And we know that it's not just an only event that happens at conversion. So why is this even a topic that we, is so important to us that we're constantly going back and forth on with all these different ideas about it? What exactly does being filled with the Spirit mean and matter? Well, the Bible calls us to live a Spirit-empowered life. We have Acts 1 to 8. And that says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses to everyone in the world. The filling of the Holy Spirit gives us power to enable us to be witnesses. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to share the gospel, the power to take authority in the spiritual realm, the power to heal through Jesus, the power to love others unconditionally, the power to drive out the demonic, the power to freely give what we have freely been given. We actually can't even live the way that God told us to without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need him to have, even have the power to pray, the power to resist temptation and the power not to sin, the power to be obedient to the Lord, the power to forgive. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to live the way that Jesus commanded us to. And without the Holy Spirit, we just simply cannot please God. And then we have the familiar Galatians 5, which talks about that spirit-led life and the fruits of the spirit. Our character is shaped and formed by the spirit. And the more we say yes to the spirit, the more fruit we have of the spirit in our life. The more we say yes to the spirit, the more we're filled by his presence. And as we're filled with the spirit of Jesus, we become like Jesus. There can be no separation between the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit. Now, some perspectives think that the filling of the spirit is only evident when the gifts of the spirit are evident. Now, from what I see in scriptures as the heart of God, when the fruit of the spirit becomes evident in our life, we are able to be trusted and steward the gifts of the spirit. So when we have both the fruits, our character, and the gifts of the spirit, and when they're both operating in your life, that's when you have maximum impact in your calling and your ministry. Now, we know that there's a very spiritual realm out there, but are we actually being intentionally aware of it in our daily lives and in our ministries? I want to assure you that the world wants an encounter with the spiritual realm, and they will do whatever it takes to get one. I was on the street evangelizing and a man was just going out for a walk <clears throat> at a close by condo. And his name was actually Christian and he wanted to know what I was doing. And I said, well, with a name Christian, you must have some sort of a religious background. And he was in fact raised in a Christian home. But for the last few years, he had um, converted over to Buddhism. Now, we began to talk about why he converted. He was telling me about different verses that he thought contradicted themselves in the Bible, and he was very familiar with the Bible. We debated apologetics, and finally he says, Val, I know all your arguments. You cannot tell me anything that's going to be, bring me back to Christ. So I changed directions, and I asked, if it's not anything that I can say, what would ever change your mind to come back to Christ? And he thought about it for a moment. And then he said, if I actually saw in the church what happened in the Bible, I'd come back to Jesus. Just take a moment to process that. If I actually saw in the church what happened in the Bible, I'd come back to Jesus. I found that sad and yet incredibly profound. He didn't know it, but what he had been seeing is a religion among the church that's being lived out in the flesh. The church and the world are so hungry for a true spiritual experience. And if they don't find it in the church, they go to other sources. I have started asking unbelievers a fun question, and that's this. Have you ever had any spiritual experiences? 
Now, usually I have to repeat the question because they're like, what? <laughs> and I explain it to them, have you had any spiritual experiences? Have you felt anything, seen anything, heard about anything? Is there any spiritual experiences you've ever had? It has been such a fun question to ask unbelievers. I have a hairdresser that I've had for 10 years and we were, she knows I'm a Christian and she's not. And um, so I just asked her that question. Hey, have you ever had any spiritual experiences? And she's like, what do you mean? And so I just explained and I just waited. And she thought about, it, she goes, yeah. Um, have you ever heard of sleep paralysis? I said, actually, I have heard of that. Tell me about it. She said this happened twice in her life before. And um, so for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, it's when people are, are wide awake, they often are in bed or they've been, they've been woken up or it's before they fall asleep and they um, almost become paralyzed, like they cannot move, they cannot speak. Um, I always ask people who tell me that they've experienced this, what was the feeling that you had when you're in this state? And the answer is always that they are terrified. They feel like there's a presence that's come over them and they um, are panicked, but they can't move or speak or call out for help. And that is what my hairdresser was experiencing. And so I just said to her, how long did it last? She goes, it felt like hours, but I don't know, maybe half an hour. I said, how did it end? She said, it just all of a sudden let go. And you got to remember, this is an unbeliever. And I said, how did you feel? Terrified? I said, did you tell anybody about it? She said, no, people think I'm crazy. And uh, so I was able to have a discussion with her just about what I believed is the source of some of those things and why. And then I just shared with her that what Christians, when they've experienced things, what they are able to do because of the authority that they've been given. I asked a stranger this actually just this week. <laughs> I struck up a conversation with a, a woman and I just asked her thoughts about religion and God and she told me she didn't believe there was a God and she believed in the universe. She was raised Catholic, but she's since long left that. I asked her all sorts of questions. I really got nowhere. So finally, I just asked if she had had any spiritual experiences and she paused and looked at me and she said, well, yes. I said, were they dark? And she said, I don't really like talking about them because they are quite dark. So I just said, have you ever heard any voices? Um, and by the way, that's very common. Um, more common than I ever realized is that people are hearing voices. Um, she said, yes, actually I do. And again, I was able to talk with her about these experiences and lead it into this spiritual conversation and about the power of Jesus. One thing you probably don't know about me, maybe some of you do, but um, before COVID, when we were having psychic fairs, um, I would go with a team to psychic fairs and we set up a booth and we're very open. We say we're Jesus Church and we talk their language and we invite them in for, for ministry, really. Um, at these psychic fairs, um, there was one in, uh, woman in particular that stands up to me. I have story after story I could spend hours to tell you, but this one young woman was there and she um, had um, come in we had um, talked with her prayed over listened to the Lord I spoke into her and um, she told us that she was a massage therapist um, but she was a very spiritual massage therapist which she worked healings using all sorts of spirits she collected spirit guides and she says you know it's really amazing how you guys hear from Jesus. I want to hear from Jesus like you do. How do you do it? And so again, speaking her language, I said, well, I had to make an agreement. I made an agreement with Jesus because, you know, he is God and he is all powerful and more over, he has authority over all those spirits um, that I would not talk to any of those spirits or serve them in any way. And in exchange, he speaks to me. He cleans me spiritually. He never abandons me. And we get to have an amazing friendship. And um, there's many things that I could explain to you about it. And she said, wow, that's a hard agreement. I said, it is, you really got to count the cost. And we were able to, again, um, get into that spiritual conversation. 
Now I tell you these stories because I want to show you how the unbelieving world is experiencing these things. And are we in the church aware that this is happening? Person after person says to me, don't think I'm crazy, but, but there's a presence that comes into my room and it's very dark. Don't think I'm crazy, but one time a demon grabbed by, me by the neck and threw me up against the wall and choked me. Don't think I'm crazy, but I have thoughts. I have voices that run through my head all day, telling me how worthless and stupid I am, telling me to hurt others and myself. People are very scared to talk about it because we don't believe them. We don't believe them due to various reasons. Our theology, maybe that demons don't operate like that. We perceive they may have mental health issues that need to be medicated or they need to receive counseling. They may. It just also makes us plain feel uncomfortable. We don't believe them because we don't feel maybe we're equipped to deal with it. And finally, you know, many times we'd actually rather just run away from the person because they truly are going to be a lot of work. So if we don't give them answers and help as Christ followers, they will either get their answer from other sources, which will lead them into deeper bondage, or they will helplessly flounder with torment, trying to numb it in several other ways. We know that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and we have the answer for their freedom. So we need to rise up. And then there's the people in our churches. I have had EMCC pastors who have come and asked me about spiritual experiences that they are having. Some negative and demonic, terrible attacks. Some are having encounters with the Holy Spirit. Some are getting prophetic words and pictures and visions and dreams. Many are nervous to talk about it. And they don't want to have accusations of being unspiritual or following false doctrine. And they don't know how to respond to either the demonic or the godly experiences because it just doesn't fit into the safe zone of Christianity. Now, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're supposed to be a family and a safe place to share our heart. So let's talk about these things and help each other grow and discern. I have so many Christians um, that I have talked to who ache to feel safe to talk about what the Holy Spirit is doing in their life. So you know what's really fun? Is asking people in the church, how does God speak to you? And have you had any spiritual experiences? You know what I often hear? I hear phrases like, well, I've never really told anyone this, but, <laughs> and then they tell me amazing spiritual experiences that they've had from the Lord. And then I've also been told countless stories from Christians who are on fire and fully devoted and surrendered that they're experiencing the spiritual realm in a negative way. Dark presence coming upon them or around them, repetitive nightmares with demonic themes, tormenting thoughts, incredible temptations, as well as demonic physical manifestations of out loud voices and sounds. So I know that's a lot to, to throw out there. But practically speaking, here's what's going on. People are having spiritual experiences. So what are we as Christians going to do about it as leaders, as people in ministry? Are we going to tell them they aren't? They're not having the spiritual experiences? Are we going to tell them to go get medicated? As Christians, when we talk to Christians, are we going to tell them they're not a Christian? Or are we going to do what Jesus did? And that's engage. So the Holy Spirit we know is called our counselor. So we must know how to be able to receive his counsel. Jesus has all authority. We dare not face these things by ourselves. And as Christians, one important thing in stewarding these things is to never venture into the spiritual realm without filtering everything through Jesus. So when these things come, good or bad, bring it straight to Jesus. We're going to now go into a breakout room, and I'm going to have you answer some questions so that we can glean from one another.
All right, well, hold on to your seats. We're gonna come back for some more. We're gonna address many issues <clears throat> on hearing God. Okay, so we know that there is the extreme charismatic viewpoint, extreme conservative viewpoint. And now there there's hundreds in between. Now, whenever there are extreme views in biblical theology, that scripture has not explicitly spelled out. <clears throat> it's usually a red zone, a warning zone. So here are the extreme views on either side of the debate. We have extreme conservative, <clears throat> and that is God does not talk to us today. The gifts of the Holy Spirit that were seen at Pentecost are not operating today. Everything God wanted to say to us is in scripture. And the gifts of Pentecost were for that time only and no longer manifest after the ministry of the disciples. <clears throat> now, this viewpoint has shut down any spiritual gifts of present communication between the Holy Spirit and his people. This has caused many believers under this view to avoid or even just fear hearing God for themselves, let alone others. Because in this viewpoint, God just doesn't use any other form of communication with his followers except through the scriptures. Now to say that God spoke to them in a different way than the scriptures would be considered heresy, delusional, or even labeled as a false prophet. <clears throat> and then we have the extreme charismatic view. And that's where it says every believer is operating in every gift. A person hears from God in every way. Every circumstance, action, thought should be looked at as communication from God. And if you just have enough faith, you can have every gift, tongues, prophecy, dreams, words of knowledge. And if you don't, <clears throat> then maybe you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, or you don't have faith, or you're not there yet, or maybe you're not even saved. Now, this is not a biblical view, and it's caused a lot of damage and caused many churches to run from all of this. It's wounded many. <clears throat> from unstewarded opinions being presented as words from God. Many have made life altering decisions based on so-called prophetic words and direction being spoken over them and then only to discover it was not wise and it was not of God. Many have felt shamed and delusions through this belief system, especially when they don't experience everything such as tongues. It causes them to feel unloved by God or not a good enough Christian, maybe not having the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Now, there are lots and lots of beliefs in between those two extreme views. Now, we have to understand <clears throat> that for everything God created, Satan wants to have a counterfeit. The Bible talks about it. God created prophecy. There are false prophets. God gave the gift of teaching. And there are false teachers. Singing can be used to worship God or to worship the things of this world. Believers can be so worried about the counterfeits that they don't even want to get near the real thing. <clears throat> but believers can also be so undiscerning that they are deceived by the counterfeits. Now, have you noticed that when this topic gets brought up between people who have differing views, there is strong emotion that arises. Often it's anger, hesitancy to talk about it, <clears throat> Usually they each want to convince and state their stance, and very rarely is there a desire to listen. This topic divides. So what is the root to these strong emotions? Well, I'd like to suggest that it's fear. I recognize it in myself, when, even when I'm talking in some circles. There's fear on both sides that their experiences or their intimacy with God won't be validated. On one side, those who are experiencing such things as tongues, perhaps visions, spirit-given dreams, promptings, they will be called heresy. They're fearing that they'll be called false or delusional or that they'll be accused of serving a different Jesus. Now, these are terrible things to be accused of or labeled as. And then on the other side, those who have not experienced those things but are diligent in reading, studying the Bible, praying, and following the Lord's commands, they fear being called a dead Christian or their, their faith is not good enough, or maybe even there's something wrong with their Christianity. And those are terrible things to be accused of. <clears throat> so both sides 
fear that the other side is spreading a different type of Christianity. Now, there are books and teachings and documentaries on both sides addressing these very concerns. And there should be, as all these fears truly can happen in both instances. Now, what I see, though, when I go out to evangelize is the world is looking at us and they're shaking their heads and they turn the other direction for their spiritual hunger to be satisfied. So remember how I talked about going to the psychic fairs? Well, guess who commonly attends? It's people who were raised in the church. The world is so hungry. Now, I love the train in the track example. So we have the word of God, the Bible. It's like a train track. It's solid. It's well built. It's foundational. It's vital and it leads to the right places. And then there's the train. And that's like the spirit. It's powerful and it's vital for movement. The train needs the track to keep it from going in the wrong places and from damage. And the track is dead and useless without the train. But when you put them together, it is amazing. So what side do you lean to? The conservative side or the charismatic side? You know what? I think we need to get rid of sides. <laughs> we all need to learn from each other. We need to glean from one another and sharpen one another. We don't have to be on one side or the other. Instead of looking at it as a line with sides, why don't we just look at it like a circle? And the kingdom of heaven is the circle. Biblical, theology, apologetics, history, they're all part of the kingdom of God. And they're fascinating. There's gifts of the spirits, hearing from God, supernatural miracles, healings, and they're all part of the kingdom of God. And they're fascinating. Am I myself? I want all of it. <laughs> I know I am weak and need to grow in some areas, but I want all the kingdom of God and all that Jesus died for and became victorious over in order to make it available to me and in order to make it available to you and for every believer to have and to know and to experience and live out. Now, part of the problem why we are a bit hesitant to engage in listening to the Lord in different forms than from scripture is again that we fear. What if it's just my voice I'm hearing? What if I'm wrong? So we have to grow in our maturity in our relationship with Christ. Let's steward well what God has made available to us. We know that there are different voices that we hear. <clears throat> There's the enemy, Satan's voice. We know in scripture, we have seen that throughout. I mean, Satan incited Peter to protest Jesus dying on the cross. We all know Judas was incited by Satan as well to betray Jesus. We then also can hear the voice of the flesh. This is out of the soul or our carnal nature. And this is where we can often get hung up. Is this God or is this me? And then we also can hear the voice of God. So how do we know what voice we're listening to? Well, to start with, we can boldly pray in faith saying, Jesus, I ask that you would silence the voice of the enemy. Lord, I submit my whole domain to, your, to you my body, my soul, my spirit. I bring my mind into submission and cooperation with your spirit. Catch that. I didn't say that we wanted to empty our minds. That's what other religions do. The mind is the gateway to the soul and we do not want to empty it. The Lord gave us our mind to cooperate with him. So we want to fill our mind with Christ. And then we ask the Holy Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. And that means we will be able to receive his counselor. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's John 10, 27. So by faith, we trust that God hears our prayer and we will not be hearing from our flesh or the enemy. Now, secondly, we test what we perceive is God speaking. The Bible tells us to test what we hear. 1 John 4, 1 says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. How do we test? Well, there's this one method that I kind of like. Um, it's a three-legged stool that you see in front of you. And the thing about a three-legged stool is that if you take one leg away, it can't stand. Now, what we need to do is place 
what we perceive as the message God is giving us on the seats of the stool, the seats of abiding. Remember, if you're not abiding, then your relationship with God is being hindered and you will have a hard time hearing him. Each leg represents the things you use to test the credibility of the message. What you can use to test the word that you've received. So let's take a look at the legs. We have the Bible. You take everything back to the written word of God. If it's completely against biblical truths, throw it away. I had one lady tell me she felt like the Lord told her to go have a man's baby that she was not married to. Well, I knew right away from the test that in the Bible, that would simply not be God's voice that she is hearing in that. Now, what if it's not specifically addressed biblically? For example, should I take a certain job? Well, we can lean on biblical tr truths around the issue. Will this job affect my family? Will this job put me in situations where I have to violate biblical principles? Will I have to promote sinful lifestyle to others? Etc. You know what I mean. But if nothing is against scripture, then lean on the other two legs of the, of the stool. We have the body of Christ. Our dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are a family and we've been given each other to sharpen and keep accountable. So does what you hear from God find confirmation in your community of faith? Maybe you take your message that you feel like God is giving you to your pastor, your mentor, small group. They can help you discern and interpret. But exercise caution in sources that you go to. Is that person spiritually discerning and godly in their character and lifestyle? And do they hear God clearly? If not, they may be giving you their opinion out of their flesh. We know that Proverbs eleven fourteen says, for lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. And then we have the third leg, and that's the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit? Meaning, does it sit right? Does it give peace or turmoil with the message? 1 Corinthians 2 talks about how Holy Spirit speaks and guides our spirit. You might want to jot that down as I don't have a PowerPoint for that. It's 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10 to 16. Now, when you look at the Greek, which I love to do, it speaks about the word of God in scripture. It uses different words to make distinctions between the written or the spoken word of God you've probably heard the word logos. And that word means the message of the words. It can be written, it can be spoken, it can be uh, all sorts of things. It's the message of what the words are spoken, logos. And then we have graphe. And that is the physical printed words on the page. It's not about the message, it's about the physical printed words. And then there's the word rhema in the Greek. Now rhema is the spoken word of God. Now, something interesting to point out, I every time I see the word word in scripture, I will look it up to find out which Greek word is it? Is it logos? Is it graphe? Is it rhema? I just find it interesting. I know that it, everything in scripture is intentional and purposeful, and that when God puts a word in it, there was a reason for it, of, of what it meant. In Ephesians 6, you know, when it talks about the armor of God, Paul talks about um, taking up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, he actually uses the word rhema. So take up the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God, the spoken word of God. I just thought that was a little cool thing to take note of. Now, some may say, makes me a little unsure or nervous when others say they hear from God for me. How can I know it actually comes from the Lord? How do I know if I can trust it? And so it makes people very nervous when others come towards them. I myself have had people say things to me claiming it was God and it's really stung. And then after using the stool method, I've been able to determine it as simply a human opinion. I didn't know it at the time, but I have learned that we don't have to fear or worry if someone says, thus saith the Lord to us. We're to be mature in our walk with the Lord. And part of that maturity is discernment. So we have the written word of God, which I talked about, and we hold it with a firm grip, a closed fist, and we do not depart from it. 
we have our rhema word of God and we hold it with an open hand. We look at it, we test it, we write it down. We watch for the fruit, we steward it well. Maybe use the stool method to test it. We pray about it and then we determine if it's from God or not. Now, sometimes we just know that the spirit of God has spoken to us. It brings tears to our eyes that we weren't expecting. Maybe we're filled with joy or holy reverence. However, sometimes we don't know. So when we hear something, either from ourselves or from someone else, we hold it and we hold it off of our heart. We test it. And once fruit appears from all those things I just mentioned, then we can let it land on our heart. Then we apply it and then we walk in it. If we are to be a people who hear the voice of God, then we must spend time in the word of God and in the presence of the Lord through prayer and abiding. Do not have that fast food, I want it now mentality when it comes to hearing God. We have been told in scripture that we can and we will hear his voice, but we are to be after relationship and intimacy with God. We don't want a relationship with just simply a book. We're not trying to validate our opinions and we simply do not want thrills of looking spiritual. So pursue him, carve out time, learn to discern his voice so that like Jesus, you may also do what you see the father doing and speak what you hear the father saying, walking in the spirit, led by the spirit, ministering through the spirit. Don't fear the counterfeit and yet be aware of it. So I'm all about practical. I love practical application because we can talk about it till we're blue in the face and discuss theologies, but until we actually apply it to our life, it's really meaningless. So let's take a look at some practical application for walking in the spirit. So for my own personal life, before I ever were to take anything to others, I must first bring myself before the Lord. I resolved to spend hours and weeks and months being intentional just the Lord and I listening. <clears throat> so here are some ways I have learned to walk in the spirit. I've numbered them just to have some clarity for you. So I'm not just running a whole bunch of things off to you, but they're not in any order. So the first thing is worship. Now we worship. And in that worship time, I ask the Lord, what is it that you want to say to me? Is there anything you want to speak to me? I write down what I sense, what I feel, what I saw. I just write it down and then I can weigh and test and measure it later. Um, I've been finding it really interesting as I've been reading the Old Testament lately that oftentimes whenever they would, the kings would call in, you know, the prophets and the, the people of the Lord and ask them to hear from the Lord for them. They often would call a harpist to come or they would, they would want to be in that time of worship. Um, it's just something that, bring, that the, the presence of the Lord comes as we glorify and magnify his name. Um, number two, I ask the Lord all kinds of questions. What do you love about me? What do you see me as? Any type of question. I just, I, I ask the question. I wait. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I'm the one that's answering it, but I write it down. And then I test, weigh, measure. I take it over to other people. Um, you know, I, I measure it with scripture, all those things, but I ask questions. I want this to be a two-way conversation between the Lord. We always say that, don't we? It needs to be a two-way conversation, not just a one-way um, conversation because it's between two. Number three, to attune my ear to the spirit. What I have done is I pictured myself back at those places I had been where I really felt the presence of the Lord in my life. And then I sit there in that memory. I remember what he showed me. I asked myself, did I obey that or did I apply it? I recall the details, pay attention to those things. I then ask him another question in it as I sit in that memory, entering his presence once again. And I enter what the Bible may call being in the spirit. It's a worthwhile practice to write down times that you've had encounters with the Lord and remember them and remind yourself of them. We know that from scriptures, when the Israelites encountered the Lord, they built an altar of remembrance. You too can build an altar of remembrance by simply writing down those things of times where you remember the Lord's presence or the things that he spoke to you or when you felt really near to him. 
And then those are times that can remind you of the things that he has shown you in the past about himself, about you, about your circumstance. And then it also brings praise and confidence and then it grows our faith in those areas. Number four, in Isaiah 61, it talks about how Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. That word bind in the Hebrew means to govern and rule brokenhearted that means the inmost places of a man and a woman places that have been smashed to smithereens so jesus came to govern and rule over the smashed places in our deepest most inmost parts sometimes i can't handle my emotions or i I can't even trust them so i ask the lord to govern and rule over my emotions and bring them into alignment with his about how he feels about me or about my situations. And then I extend it to my perspectives. I ask the Lord to govern and rule over my perspectives and bring them into alignment with his perspectives and how he sees things. And then five, I ask the Lord to fill me fresh with his spirit every day, as we talked about at the beginning, that it is continual, that filling. I surrender all areas to him. And it gives a a great time where I can go, am I surrendered in this area of my life? I like to attune my ears to his voice and ask him to open my spiritual ears. I intentionally will pause to get direction from him before going forward on things. So what are some practical things in the church and ways in the church that we can be led by the spirit? Well, here's a few. Number one, When I'm in a meeting and others are talking, I will intentionally start to listen vertically as well as horizontally to the people that are talking. I ask the Lord, what does he see in them? And to open my eyes to what he loves about them or has deposited in them. It takes practice. And I, as I said, I need to be intentional. Perhaps the Holy Spirit will give me a verse or maybe one word. I will sometimes do this before I even go to a, maybe a smaller meeting where I know who will be there. I'll write it down and then I share it with each person at maybe the beginning or the end of the meeting. This just completely changes the dynamics in a meeting so that it is spirit-led rather than agenda-led. Number two, when I'm praying in a group, I again will start listening while a person is praying. I'll ask the Holy Spirit to pray through me and I'll ask him How should I pray? I don't want to pray my own opinion or my own desires for a person or a situation because that's just control. (laughs) I may even need to let the person or persons know that I need a minute to just listen before I begin. This also models to the others around me to pause and just listen to the Holy Spirit before praying. Sometimes people will say, well, I don't hear anything when I do that. And you know what? That's okay because at least you've given that space and you've postured your heart before the Lord, and then you just ask the Holy Spirit to speak his words through you. Third, you know, I often will take a look at um, when there's pastors or leaders or people in ministry that I, I see in my church, I will take time to pray for them and ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to say to them or what he loves about them or how he wants to bless them. And then I'll send a text to them about it after first I've stewarded it. And sometimes I've even had to wait months as I've just waited on the Lord to confirm and to give me peace before sending that text. I use 1 Corinthians 14, 3 as a parameter. Is it strengthening? Is it encouraging? Is it comforting? Then I'll speak it out. Now, um, if it's not, let's say it is not encouraging, comforting, (laughs) because sometimes the Lord shows us things about a person that perhaps is not that way. First of all, I'm going to ask God, why is he showing me this? And what does he want me to do about it? Is it for my knowledge to know how to pray for them and speak into the situation? Is it for me to flip it and call that person to rise up? For example, if I were to sense maybe a spirit of greed on someone, I might pray and bless them to have a heart of generosity. See how I flip that. I want to call them up. Maybe I sense a spirit of lust. I'm going to call them to purity and integrity and pray over them. Maybe envy. 
I will pray and ask the Lord that they would become a man or a woman of selflessness and um, where they will serve others. Maybe um, I see that they're constantly justifying things. Well, then I'm going to pray and bless them to become a, a man after God's heart to defend those who cannot defend themselves. And so, again, it's about stewarding. And then that, you know, the, the Lord, if he's going to trust us with things, um, then we have to steward them well through his spirit. You know, when I started out, I just had a hard time getting the courage up and taking risk in any of this. So what I did is I just started to engage people by looking for physical things that I liked about people, their hair, their glasses, their shoes, and then make a comment. I like your hair. That was just to help me get started to be able to engage people and to get out of that fear of talking to people. Um, and then from there, I transitioned into asking the Holy Spirit open my eyes to see what you see about that person. And then I was able to then speak that out easier to them. Now, if a negative word or a rebuke does come to me and the Lord wants me to share it with a person, I will always go privately to that person in a heart posture of love. And really we need to be near tears in order to share it. I ask the Lord for his heart in the matter and to align my heart with his. If it doesn't grieve me to speak about it, then I need more time in prayer and fasting. So again, this is stewarding the heart of God and the stewarding our words wise because there has been so much damage in this area of the church. And finally, um, when praying for someone in my personal time with the Lord, I will bring them before Jesus and then I'll test what I see and sense and hear by asking questions. Um, I have a Quick example, I was praying for a friend of mine who had breast cancer and she had also found out her husband had skin cancer and they were just really in a, in a tough time. So I was praying for them one time in my quiet time and I just pictured bringing them for Jesus and I just started to pray for them. Um, the way that the Lord speaks to me is that sometimes he just sort of takes over and I watch. And what happened in that time was I saw that um, my friend, she was in the middle holding Jesus's hand and holding her husband's hand. But I noticed her husband and Jesus were not holding hands. I saw Jesus go and take his right hand and put it on um, the right side, which this is my right side, this would be in the camera, <laughs> and lay it just over her chest. And I saw him take his left hand and put it on the left side of her husband's chest. That was it, made no sense to me. I wrote it down. A couple of weeks later, I was visiting with her and I said, do you mind me asking what um, side of the breast cancer that you had was on? And she says, oh yeah, it was on my right. And I said, oh, I said, do you mind me asking where your husband had skin cancer? Um, she goes, yeah, you know, it's kind of weird. Most people get skin cancer on their face or something that is exposed to the sun. He had a spot on the left side of his chest. So if you remember, that's what I saw. And then she went on to um, share with me that her husband was really struggling and not walking with the Lord at that time. Remember that detail that he wasn't holding hands with Jesus. And so that was a huge confirmation and way to be able to test and learn. And you see how I stewarded that as well. So just a, an interesting example for you as you pray for people. All right, so how do we practically do this outside the church in life? Well, we all have appointments and oftentimes appointments you have to wait. Well, there's people sitting at the reception desk and there's people waiting in the waiting room for their appointments. So you just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anybody here that you want to draw my attention to? And is there anything you want me to say to them? You can go to the grocery store, man. I, I go to the grocery store every week. There's so many people around. There's those that are shopping. There's the cashier. Um, I just asked the cashier the other day, what is tattoos meant? He lit up and he told me all about them. <laughs> and then I was able to speak a few words of life because I was listening vertic or horizontally to him. But then I began to ask right away vertically to the Holy Spirit as he spoke. What do you want me to say to this, this gentleman? What do you love about him? What are some of the meanings in his tattoos that you want to speak to him through? And in Starbucks, um, I asked the Lord how he feels about the barista while I'm waiting for her to fill my order. And then I speak it to her when she gives me my drink. You go to the malls, there's always people sitting, walking all around. One time I was at the mall and there was a man that was walking and God just kind of got my attention. 
And he went into a store. And so I sat down on a bench outside and I just asked the Lord, what, what do you, what is it about him that you're drawing my attention to? And, and again, it's that intentional. I mean, I have a thousand things to do. I could just continue to run through them all. I have to intentionally stop and go, okay, Lord, yes, what? The word that I kept getting was loneliness. And I thought that would be pretty awkward to go up to this man and say, hey, I see that you're lonely. And so <laughs> I wanted to get more and steward it more better. Um, he came out of the store. He went down the escalator and the mall was busy. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to lose him. So I ran after him and I was actually a little bit out of breath. And I'm like, excuse me, sir. And I still didn't know what else to say. But I said, excuse me, sir. Um, I know this sounds really weird. I love Jesus. Um, he just sort of drew my attention to you as you were walking. And he just showed me that. And I thought, here we go, take the risk that you're, you're feeling lonely. And as soon as I took the risk, it was like the spirit of God just right away gave me the rest to say. And I said, and he wants to have you know that if you come into relationship with him, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And the man stopped and he looked at me and goes, thank you. I can go home now. I have been wandering this mall for two hours. I haven't known why. I have nothing to shop for, but I just felt like I couldn't go home. So I was able to explain to him the gospel really quickly, all that he could do in order to come into relationship with Jesus. I said, would you like to do that? He goes, you know what? I think I'm going to go home and I'm going to do that tonight between God and me. I said, amen. <laughs> Praise God. See you later. Um, you know, when you go on walks, you just ask and you pray and you tell the Lord you're willing and available and ask for opportunities. I have so many stories. I don't have time to say them all. If you go to the train station, the transit station, all these things, you go to the gym as you're working out, you just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anybody here that you want me to speak to? Is um, anybody that you want me to pray for? So in your prayer time, ask the Lord who you should pray for and for what? First name that comes to you, pray for them. And then with a text or a message, eek, I know that sounds scary, but tell them that while you were spending your time with the Lord today, he brought them to your mind and you prayed for them. I have reached out to people that I haven't seen in 20 years because the Lord brought them to my mind and I've texted them and said, I just want to let you know that I'm praying for you today. Um, and it's been really incredible. You know, on Facebook, you get those birthday notifications. Well. Again, the person that's their birthday asks the Lord, Lord, why are you glad that they're born? Why do you still have them living? Why did you decide for this time? Pray about it, press into it, listen, and then send them that birthday um, blessing from the Lord and what you've heard. There's, um, you, you, I, I love going up to complete strangers. You never know what's going to happen. I got to share this quick story. There was a lady that um, I was just grabbing some lettuce in the produce department, and I hear this voice. Uh, Good morning. How are you today? It was not the Lord. It was the lady It was that worked there. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, I'm good. How are you? And she's like, um, that's so great. I had a rough night. I'm like, oh, too bad. Hope your day gets better. And I turned and I laughed. And as soon as I walked away, I instantly felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit of going, Val, if that was your evangelism night, would you not have talked with her? <laughs> yeah. And I was just feeling so um, kind of rushed and I felt nervous and she was now talking with another customer and I thought it'd be so weird. And I went to the checkout and I went home. I chalked it up as another failure story of mine. However, all week I was feeling bothered about it and I started to pray about it. And I'm like, all right, Lord, if you know, if you bring her back to me somehow, some way, then I will talk to her this time. Two weeks later, I am in the grocery store. No word of a lie. I am reaching for the lettuce. I hear, good morning, how are you? I turned, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, good. And right away, uh, another lady came and asked her a question. And so I, I, I kind of froze and I turned my cart and I went down aisle five away. And I thought, well, I could, now I know she's here. I could come back next week. And you know what, but you know what? As I was praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit convicted me. And this is something I'm bringing up to share with you. He said, Val, do not ask to hear from me if you are not going to obey me. 
So I turned my car around <laughs> and I felt like the Lord was saying, um, she has pain. I thought, okay, easy. I can pray for healing. So I went back to her and I said, uh, excuse me. She's like, yes. I said, I know this sounds really weird. I saw you a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, uh, I love Jesus. God's been bringing you to my mind. I've been praying for you. And he's just shown me that um, you have pain. And I was just wondering if I could pray for healing. And she just looked at me and she started to fall. And she said, can I hug you? And I said, yes. So I gave her a hug. And um, here I'm thinking maybe her elbow or her foot hurts. She's like, no, my husband from um, of 30 years just left me. And it's been weeks where I have been um, depressed. I can't sleep. I can't eat. It's my job is suffering. I'm just going through this horrible time. So I asked if I could pray for her. I dug Kleenexes out of my purse and handed it to her. And she said, yes, pray for me. So I prayed over her and left. Um, you know, I walked away thinking I was this close to missing that opportunity because I felt a little embarrassed. So God has given you the Holy Spirit. And yes, there's a risk. There's a risk. You may get it wrong, but you're never going to get it right unless you step out. There may be a fear that you may cause damage somehow. And the Lord already knows that he's going to take care of that. And he humbles um, us. And as we humble ourselves before him and others, and we abide ourselves and we equip ourselves. So yes, you may have fear, but do it anyway, because it keeps you reliant on the spirit and not on yourself. Now there's a phrase out there right now that's constantly being said, and here it is, stay safe. You guys have been hearing that? Stay safe, stay safe, stay safe. And I understand why it's being said. But my answer to that spiritually is no, we're not called to a safe life. There's a part in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where Susan asks if Aslan the Lion, who's representing Jesus, is safe. Is he safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he ain't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So we're not called to be safe. We're called to steward well what we have available to us and eagerly desire the things of the spirit. So we are going to go into our last breakout room where we're going to practice some of these things. I just wanted to say, you know, as we talk about these things in conclusion, if you were to define what it looks like to walk in the spirit or to be led by the spirit, now what would you say? Would it be that walking in the spirit means to follow all of commands, God's commands? Well, yes and no. Paul did that. And then he said he considered it worthless compared to knowing God. And the word used in Philippians 3.10, when he says, I want to know Christ, that word is the Greek word gnosko. And it means to both to understand and to know experientially and to feel. He wanted to experience and feel Christ in his understanding. So God does not want to control our minds. We are told to govern our minds, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We're told to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. God does not control our actions. In Romans 6, 12 to 13 says that we get a choice to present our bodies to sin or to God. So we have to make a decision by our will and by the power of the spirit who enables us to let the spirit of God lead us. To walk by the spirit or to be led by the spirit is to be attuned, intentional to listen, intentional to consult, having relationship and knowing how the spirit communicates. So then we are able to obey our God. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Val. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I love your stories. And again, you can contact uh, Val at emccenrich.ca. You can just find her uh, page there and read all about her and send her a message. Thank you, everybody. Blessings on the rest of your day.